As one would come to realize, while traversing such fields of research as we do, you will inevitably come face to face with a worthy adversary. That foe, of course, is modern paradigm. Often scoffed at when discussing the possible existence of a highly trained, highly secret group of worldwide individuals who are tasked with the protection of a profitable lie. Often labeled a conspiracy theorist due to the vast array of missing evidence and stolen relics. Yet, alas, regardless of this, we feel it is our duty to vindicate all those who have suffered for doing nothing more than tell the truth. Many thanks to Will Hart over at Nexus Magazine in Spain for his exhaustive research. Let's start with a familiar friend, the Great Sphinx. In 1993, NBC aired a show titled The Mysteries of the Sphinx. During the show, geological evidence was shown which indicated that the Sphinx was vastly older than Egyptologists currently claim. This evidence has subsequently become popularly known as the water erosion controversy. The self-taught Egyptologist John Anthony West first brought the evidence to the attention of geologist Dr. Robert Schock. Now, after thoroughly studying the Sphinx firsthand, numerous geologists share West's conclusions, and many have announced their findings to the world. Dr. Zawi Hawass, along with the Egyptian antiquities, have launched a barrage of public criticism at this new evidence. Renowned Egyptologist Dr. Mark Lehner who is regarded as the world's foremost expert on the Sphinx, also joined this attack, publicly declaring West and Shock as ignorant and insensitive. The smear campaign was ultimately a success and squashed any further exploration of the theory. This, regardless of the overwhelming evidence supporting their claims. And this intellectual mudslinging is unfortunately quite common. The case of author Michael Cremo could be seen as a well-documented example of this, and it also exposes just how the scientific establishment openly uses pressure tactics on the media and government to stifle historical truths. In Michael's book, Forbidden Archaeology, he examines many artifacts that prove modern man's antiquity far exceeds the age currently accepted by academia. In 1996, when NBC broadcasted a special program called The Mysterious Origins of Man, they covered material from Cremo's book. The reaction from the scientific community could be seen as verging on ridiculous. NBC was deluged with letters from furious scientists and others within certain fields who all called the producer a fraud and the whole program a hoax, even attempting to force NBC to not rebroadcast the popular program ever again. They went to the tremendous effort of presenting a case to the federal government, requesting that the Federal Communications Commission step in and bar NBC from airing the program again. This was not only an apparent infringement of free speech and a blatant attempt to thwart commerce, but up to that point, it was an unprecedented effort to censor intellectual discourse. Dr. Virginia Steen McIntyre would also feel the cold hands of conspiracy. A geologist working for the U.S. Geological Survey, she was dispatched to an archaeological site in Mexico with the task of dating a group of artifacts. This particular case, again, perfectly illustrates just how far this elusive establishment is willing to go to guard orthodox tenants. McIntyre used state-of-the-art equipment to date the relics, but her results were off the charts. The lead archaeologist expected a date of 25,000 years or less. Yet she found dates of 250,000 years or more on multiple occasions. A dating of 25,000 years is conveniently critical to the Bering Strait crossing theory. Once her results were realized, the head archaeologist decided to dispose of Steen McIntyre's results. She has since found it hard to get her papers published, and she has also lost a teaching job at an American university. These sorts of scenarios from these particular types of people is what drives us to expose the truth. No one should lose their career because they are doing it correctly. Unfortunately, however, unless there is a dramatic shift within our own society, stories such as these are likely to continue. Many ancient sites found scattered all over the planet share an enigmatic feature. A pattern of scarring left upon their megalithic blocks and often upon their walls, once left by a technology built by an as yet not understood civilization. 
We've previously covered the perplexing technique often used by ancient wall builds, found all around the world in the form of mysterious metal clamps. Used to seat huge stone blocks as they settled over the following years, these clamps dated to similar times within antiquity and varying in style from continent to continent somehow turned up all over the world at around the same time, strongly suggesting some form of intercontinental travel and thus sharing of technologies. Furthermore, and perhaps more intriguing, are the links that we, here on the channel, along with others in alternative research, and even funded institutes from nations around the world have begun to notice and hopefully triangulate a signature left by this once highly advanced group of individuals. The most noticeable of these sites, and the one which initially started us upon this journey, was Long Yu Cave in China. A cave system hewn from solid bedrock, leaving no waste piles of stone anywhere, marking the stone with a telltale scar pattern. These parallel marks are not just found at Long Yu. Similar yet not identical marks have also been found elsewhere on Earth. A slight variation in style is what one would expect with shared knowledge. As with the metal clamps, a slight variation can be found from continent to continent. These similar marks can also be found at the ancient quarry of Yangshan, China, and Petra in Jordan, both argued for years to actually be the workmanship of a civilization far older than any noted within modern academia. These marks were then discovered to be upon the ceiling of Cave 1 at the ancient site of Mamalapuram within India, another site which in places shows levels of erosion far in excess of that which should be seen at a site dated within known history. Yet perhaps the most impressive of these marks, and most probably the ones made by the conceptual machine of origin, are the scars witnessed and now subsequently catalogued at Baalbek. These are far too large for any hand tool made into solid granite with such precision. These also display circular motions, as if left by a modern-day tunnel boring machine. This evidence, undoubtedly unnoticed upon many more ancient sites, is clearly compelling evidence to support our channel's hypothesis that a mysterious history once occurred here on our planet, and will hopefully shed some light on the amazing people responsible for this phase of our past. Thanks for watching guys, and until next time, take care. Just how old is human civilization? It should be clear to anyone who has spent any length of time perusing our channel that the majority of our antiquity, no matter how astonishing, is, according to modern academia, all built by our less capable ancestors, placed considerably more recently within human history. During our extensive research, we have often unearthed overwhelming evidence for an immensely larger human timeline. Additionally, we feel there is strong evidence to suggest that more than one period of prosperity has been experienced in the past. We have realized that this record of past global inhabitancy is merely limited to its resistance to erosion. Put another way, there appears that many past civilizations have come and gone, going back beyond what is now still in existence. The human species, it seems, has outlived the existence of our oldest ruins here on Earth. Many ruins we have explored are now argued as geological formations. This authoritative subjection is merely testament to their immense age, and also begs the question what other ruins may have been lost to erosion. How much older does human civilization actually reach back in time? And just how advanced have past civilizations become? One clue to this answer lays within the ruins themselves. Astonishing feats of engineering that not only indicate a high level of intelligence, but also technological prowess. Extraordinarily refined works, which can still be found in the less inhospitable environments of Earth. One of these lesser shared sites is undoubtedly Varangal. Located within the South Indian state of Telangana, it was predictably once snapped up by our less capable ancestors, possibly claimed as their own, subsequently becoming their capital. Home of the Kakatiya dynasty from the 12th to 14th centuries, this inhabitation, we feel, has then been used regardless of the ancient ruins in question to age the stone carvings which can be found at the site. Stone monuments carved with such accuracy, skill, and precision that they evade any logical explanation as to how they could have been completed 
with any of the technologies we know were available to the Cacatians, specifically within the 12th century. The site clearly demonstrates tremendous skill and also technological prowess. These stone monuments were clearly not only created to express an artistic message, but they were undoubtedly created to display the creator's capabilities, encapsulated in time, quite possibly for the exact purpose of people like us to recognize them, as they may have with similar ruins that were possibly in existence during their own lifetimes. There is a greatly more interesting and extensively larger story to tell regarding the history of our planet. However, as long as those in power feel inadequate simply saying, we don't know, ignorance and lies will continue to plague our species. There have been many occasions here upon our channel where we have explored artifacts and evidential ruins indicative of a tremendous prehistoric age testimonies, photography, even physical proofs, locations of some finds making their ages undeniably enormous. This, along with the sheer amount of said evidence collected and exposed over the years, making their authenticity and indeed the evidence to suggest the existence of a now lost yet once incredibly ancient civilization overwhelming. With our next expose of ancient finds of no exception, Although the following could have been aiding in the expansion of mankind's knowledge of its origins, it has instead been quietly ignored by those in favor of doubling down on a funded paradigm, one seemingly crumbling around them. Greece, a thorn in the side of many an academic for centuries, with unexplainable architecture and finds that simply lack explanation. There exists, however, a far deeper reason for this persisting annoyance – the competing recordings of finds made far before any funded paradigm had arisen, by people in positions of specialist authorities, documentation of remains of human inhabitation supporting our many videos' subject matters. These finds dated within the Pliocene era of at least some two to five million years ago. As mentioned in The Forbidden Archaeologist by Michael Cremo, quote, Today, scientists say that the oldest evidence for human presence in Greece can be found at the Petrolona site, where human bones and artifacts, attributed to our archaic Homo sapiens, go back to between 200,000 and 500,000 years ago. But taking the role of the Egyptian priest, I might say to these modern Solons that the history of a human presence in Greece goes much further back than they might imagine. The Greek scientist who reported the Petrolona discovery, A. N. Polianos, announced further discoveries far more ancient than Petrolona Man. The Anthropology Museum of Petacus gave the following information. In 1977, Isaac Pandelidis, the owner of a sand pit not far from the village of Perticus, chanced upon the remains of a large animal. He informed the Greek Anthropological Society, and the excavations were directed by the anthropologist Eris Polianos, who brought to light the skeleton of a mammoth, approximately 3 million years old. Though the entire skeleton was found, the bones were in disarray and had evidently been killed, butchered, and consumed by humans. End quote. This timeline flies in the face of modern evolutionary chronology and, if accepted as it should, coming from legitimate sources who documented said finds correctly, the timeline of man should rightly be pushed back to an unknown origin, and we strongly feel more effort should be put into this investigative direction. The mammoth, along with Cremo's effortless correlation of the facts, is a gem of proof and a continued glimmer of hope that if such finds continue to surface, modern paradigms will slowly shift to a more critically established realization of not only our history, but of our existence itself. It was a find, and indeed is a journey, which we find highly compelling. We recently made a community post pertaining to the remarkable yet little-known or indeed studied discovery made within the extremely ancient city of Petara in modern-day Turkey. And due to popular demand, we are going to cover this peculiar artifact in greater depth. As mentioned, although there are many archaeological sites within Turkey, and particularly within this region, this peculiar feature is rarely discussed within modern academic or archaeological circles, 
and once you realize what this enormous relic might have once been, you may realize why. Known as the ancient aqueduct of Patera, it was once a series of tubular systems hewn from solid sandstone, presumably running from settlement to settlement. Some parts clearly displaying a significant level of erosion, indicating a truly colossal antiquity that has, unfortunately, made reconstruction of some of the pipes quite difficult. Claimed to be that of the Romans, used for transportation of water, however, what is interesting regarding Patera, and indeed many other ancient sites claimed by the Romans as their own constructions, is that it too holds some unexplainable features, things that separate it from the other, more standard Roman architecture. It seems for many ancient, highly eroded sites found around our world, the culprit for construction is often put upon the most convenient candidate, completely absent of any explanation regarding construction. In 1993, a monumental pillar was discovered at Patera, on which is a Greek dedication to Claudius and an official announcement of the building of roads by the governor, Quintus Veranius Nepos, in giving place names and distances, essentially an entire public itinerary, yet alas, they forgot to mention the enormous undertaking that was the aqueduct. One has to wonder, where did the Romans get all their ingenious ideas? Were they all originals? Or perhaps, as we have posited in the past, akin to the ancient Egyptians, had some helpful head starts from a once far more capable, far more knowledgeable people who left structures still standing to this day? The little research that we have unearthed regarding the original site does indeed indicate that Patera's ancient piping system is in fact not Roman but the origin of the Romans' inspiration when it came to the creation of their own piping systems. Even the original settlement and building of Patera was attributed to and named after Patera, son of Apollo, a great deity, a mythical figure. It pertains to a first, highly eroded, perplexing stretch of 5.4 kilometers along the steep western slope of Kisla Mountain, down to the community of Akbel. Details from RomanAqueducts.com regarding the research is as follows, quote, It originally consisted of a masonry channel, presumably of Hellenistic age, of which only scant relics remain. This stretch was later replaced, probably by the Romans, by a single line of 55 to 58 centimeter long ceramic pipes. The pipeline was laid directly on the ground, alongside the abandoned channel, and locally positioned on low rocks or in cut rocks." End quote. Are we looking at a far more ancient, far more advanced relic than one is first led to believe? A relic later replicated to a certain degree by the Romans for their own ends. We find the evidence to suggest such highly compelling. We have, in the past, explored, although albeit briefly, the astonishing, perplexing, and as yet unexplained ancient ruins that can be found within the ancient city of Aksa, located within modern-day Ethiopia. One of the main reasons we have repeatedly touched upon this exquisite site, a place located so far from the academically claimed civilizations, who some daring academics would even attempt to claim as the builders of such, its remarkably remote location alone could be seen as a smoking gun in regards to a conspiracy regarding the chronology of man. However, what we find even more incredible regarding this site, the fact that the site is renowned for its obelisks, often named in mainstream reports as the site of a singular obelisk of Axum, instead of the accurate plural, obelisks of Axum. A ruse mystery history suspects is due to the toppled obelisk not only are there many obelisks at the site, so sharing it online as merely the site of the quote, obelisk of Axum, is not only inaccurate, but we feel clearly an attempt to stifle people's discovery of this toppled obelisk, which has been estimated to have weighed hundreds, possibly upwards of a thousand tons in weight, once carved, transported, and erected at the site. Located in a place now known today as Axum City, it is located within the northern regions of Ethiopia, found within the northern Stele Park. Furthermore, the obelisks alone contain even more evidential features 
to indicate that these structures were not only built by a lost civilization, but the same civilization, possibly responsible for the Great Pyramid's construction and many other ancient ruins throughout the world, for these perplexing false doors permeate the world's ancient foundations. Any ancient site which we come across during our explorations of antiquity, adorned with false doors, we know are extremely old ruins. False doors permeate nearly all ancient sites and ruins throughout the globe, and their true purpose for being remains a complete mystery. Additionally, if the fact that false doors indicative of the ancient pyramid builder's architectural signature and the toppled obelisk weighing hundreds of tons is not enough compounding evidence to convince you that the site was once the work of a lost civilization. The underground chambers at the site, actually created using polygonal masonry, should be the final nail in the investigative pursuit for all. Thus, directly connecting polygonal builders to architectural signatures found throughout the globe, most notably ancient Peru, even Giza and the Great Pyramids. Who were these elusive builders? Obelisks are clearly indicative of an ancient Egyptian construction, yet regardless of the reality that this is a rarely shared factual lead, connecting Axum to the pyramid builders themselves, and indeed the makers of the false doors, and the additional polygonal masonry, is an incredibly interesting link. Due to previous research, we know particularly regarding the casing stones in Giza, the polygonal casing stones upon the pyramids were of a significantly younger age than the highly eroded sandstone pyramids. Yet, here it is in the same build which displays false doors, a feature which does, in fact, date from the same era, a perplexing enigma to unravel. It is a mystery which we find highly compelling. Along with the many other unexplainable feats, undoubtedly left by a highly advanced, highly capable lost civilization. There are the countless examples of extreme precision stone cutting. Not only is this remarkable past capability visible in their many stone walls and fortresses alike, but also in their exquisite artwork. If we look upon the statues of ancient Egypt, for example, the symmetry, along with the proportional precision present within their statues, is not only perfection personified, but unquestionably far too advanced for the so-called academically claimed builders to have achieved. According to the academics, along with their subsequent supposed accurate writings, these extraordinary feats of artistic perfection were somehow created by a group of individuals who were merely equipped with copper tools. Not only is this claim clearly ignorant of reality, but to create such works of symmetrical accuracy was unquestionably the work of a group of individuals far more advanced than even that of the Victorians, let alone those who thrived along the banks of the Nile more than 3,000 years ago. Not only is this precision present along the Giza Plateau, but it is also found at ancient sites all around the world. Masterfully created statues and structures often carved straight out of stone bedrock, with such vision and artistic prowess that many now presume that the individuals capable of such feats must have had advanced machinery at their disposal. Most of ancient India, for example, is created with such delicacy and exactness that we today could only accomplish the same with the utilization of modern machines. Furthermore, many scholars and independent researchers even a number of highly recognized academic Egyptologists have reluctantly concluded that many of the basalt, gypsum, and other vases shaped from extremely hard stones, and indeed a number of multi-ton sarcophagus lids, were indeed turned into the shapes we see them as today, on some kind of ancient, enormous lathe. This conclusion is made regardless of the fact that to create such enormous stoneworks on a lathe would have undoubtedly been out of the realms of capabilities for those who are currently claimed as their creators. Not only do the ornamental artifacts of Egypt and much further afield strongly indicate machined working, but there is also overwhelming evidence of these same machines reminiscent of modern stone-cutting equipment present all over the world. 
yet conveniently, it is quietly ignored by the same individuals who have supposedly unraveled the history of these sites. Puma Panku, Giza's basalt floor, other areas throughout Giza, Peru, Malta, the list goes on. All these sites not only indicate an advanced, highly capable constructor, but also possess countless marks that, as of yet, we can only explain logically as having been left by precision, quick-rotation, stone-cutting machinery. They are yet another overwhelming collection of evidence, which not only flies in the face of current academic explanation, but proof of an advanced, now lost civilization having once been responsible for these sites' construction. They are highly compelling. While perusing the many perplexing sites we are yet to cover on our channel, we stumbled across something which could quite possibly be a massive clue, evidence left as to the method of construction of many ancient sites found all over Earth. Our channel has, for a long time, put forward the hypothesis that a highly advanced worldwide civilization once flourished here on our planet. We believe that many of the ancient sites which display unexplained architecture were left by this lost people, placed far within our distant past. And once one begins to investigate these ruins with this possibility in mind, you start to notice some compelling things regarding these amazing sites. For example, the metal clamps we have previously covered, often created using impressive mixes of alloys and somehow poured molten, could now be seen as earlier architectural examples less than the mortarless, mysteriously notched stonework, also found in similar areas all over the world, with the more precise and thus more impressive stonework, seen as a later, more sophisticated method of construction. What's more, Although virtually all ancient sites have been dated to the most convenient suspects within known taught history, there also exists the numerous caves and temples, hewn from the solid bedrocks, carved with such accuracy and vision, they elude recreation even by our modern-day technology. And while looking at an amazing rock-cut cave within the site of Mamalapuram, India, a site we are now convinced was left by this same civilization a curious piece of evidence seemingly presented itself. Upon the roughly finished roof of this ancient cave is evidence left by the same technology used to not only cut the astonishingly huge Longyu Caves, but also the abandoned Langshan Quarry, both in China. This discovery, we believe, is only just the beginning of a realization that these telltale signatures are present at many other unexplained sites around the world. We have long stipulated that many of the ancient ruins claimed by our more modern-day ancestors are most likely not their actual creations. If the structure does date to this more recent age, they are usually found to be sitting upon the telltale remnants of a highly precise ancient foundation originally left by this elusive group. Who were these amazing people? When did they flourish here on Earth? What happened to them? Why did they never record how they created such wonders? Although it is easy for skeptics to argue that the caves and architecture were merely created through excruciating hard labor, any practical demonstration of this has eluded us for many centuries. Furthermore, many of the extensive cave excavations found all over the world, presumably dating back to this bygone age, are all absent any waste as if the machine tasked with creating these underground labyrinths turned stone to dust. And although the technology and or possible machinery tasked with the job has evaded modern archaeology to this point, it is clearly another piece of evidence which takes us one step closer to unraveling the true history of our planet. There are a considerable number of ancient anomalies located within Egypt. These ancient feats of engineering litter sites and the quarries the stones were sourced and shaped at. And although many of you would have heard of Aswan Quarry, Elephantine may be a less familiar location to you, and for good reason. Not only are the pyramids one of the most perplexing, near-perfectly constructed, and as yet unexplained ancient architectural accomplishments on Earth, 
but how an ancient civilization, supposedly placed within permitted known archaeological history, accomplished such a feat, or indeed why? What was their original purpose? Academic contradiction, a severe lack of anomalous artifacts explored, never mentioned or somehow conveniently go unnoticed. However, in the real world, beyond the boundaries of the fenced or so-called schools of education, thanks to our own work and the presentation of such a volume of inexplicable events artifacts, ruins or megaliths, along with many others allied within similar fields, independently funded researchers, investigative agents, and many more sometimes even noticed first by a viewer credited with its rediscovery within our coverage. Thanks to all this movement working to expose such enigmas, has meant that not only are these incredible characteristics now being documented, mentioned, popularized, photographed and studied more and more each day, now being recognized by more and more critically thinking individuals individually finding evidence of lost technologies that had until then either been undiscovered or deliberately overlooked by the funded academic. The vast catalog of unexplained architecture, again growing by the day, but also the often accompanying curious stone cuts, scars and striations, all clearly left by high-speed disc-cutting machine, a signature tool mark, identical to that which is left by modern-day power tools, along with the still absent demonstration of the methods used to construct the pyramids, leads anyone to this ongoing and seemingly most controversial of arguments regarding the origins of the ruins found across Egypt. The Colossus of Memnon, each one weighing far over 1,000 tons, would sing every morning an amazing ability we have covered in a previous video, a curious characteristic reported all the way up until the Roman era. We also covered the thick layer of sea salt once found coating the pyramid's ground and underground caverns, along with a water line reported at around 40 meters up their sides still visible during the Spanish invasion. This clearly suggests that the pyramids and their accompanying sphinx are in reality so old they even had once been submerged in ocean waters. An ancient ocean which over the eons has shifted, leaving behind sediment in the form of the desert sands. There are many enormous ancient megalithic stones hidden in and around the three great pyramids of Egypt. Not only are there enormous ancient stones virtually hidden in plain sight, thus although walked across, largely overlooked, hardly ever mentioned, and never explained in regards to their transport and placement, as modern academia will never be able to provide a logical, sound explanation for these feats. The casing stones, an area of interest we have explored and documented, not only displayed vastly different ages but also construction methods and types of stone sourced and used. Ultimately, undeniable proof of efforts to preserve the outer stones of these incredible ancient pyramids later on within their history. Signature tool marks, unique features such as protuberances, masonry shapes, polygonal stonewalling, and many other features which we have discovered during our explanations into the relics of lost antiquity. Yet Egypt's most intriguing assets, and we feel the most baffling relics which all alternative historians should have within their debacle armory, are undoubtedly to be found within the once abruptly abandoned quarries. The unfinished obelisk found at Aswan, being one such relic, the most well-known of these incredible stones by a long way, not only is the obelisk over 1,000 tons, but also due to the identifiable scoop-like tool marks left upon its granite sides, a signature scarring, which again we have so far found, explored and shared this marking at many other ancient sites around the world. Who were the original builders of the Great Pyramids? Were they the same group that quarries Aswan? What tools did these people use to cut many of the relics still left at the Elephantine Island Quarry? How can anyone gaze upon such precision stonework and not ponder, how did he accomplish such an incredible finish with such hard stone, with such soft chisels and those made of copper? 
Not only do we find the currently attested tale of events vastly incomplete, but in many ways, virtually impossible. Predictably, we are often confronted with an illogical explanation as to the origins of many unexplainable ruins. Yet Egypt, in particular Aswan and Giza, were clearly the work of a group capable of working and building with 1,000 ton plus stones. With columns of pink Aswan granite, weighing over 14 tons each, over 10,000 kilometers to Baalbek. Is this connection mere coincidence? Or are the builders of said sites connected somehow? Possibly one and the same? Questions we get closer to answering every day. We find it highly compelling. Many ancient sites found all over the world can no longer be explained away with currently attested academic opinion. Who they say built them, why, or when they were created. The most popular of these anomalies are the ancient monuments that can be found upon the Giza Plateau. Currently explained as having been built by our copper tool-wielding ancestors a mere 4,000 years ago, somehow successfully creating some of the most precisely built and indeed enormous ancient structures found on Earth, decidedly choosing to use granite blocks many tons in weight as their building material of choice. Ironically, although these sites are somehow exclaimed as having been built by the ancient Egyptians, any actual, literal explanation of how this was actually done has never been provided. Not only is academic opinion severely lacking any logical understandings as to the construction of these sites, they seemingly attempt to ignore and, in some cases, conceal additional controversial anomalies they simply cannot understand. Enormous stone megaliths are hidden all over Giza, and especially around the base of the Great Pyramids. And not only were these buildings adorned with incredibly hard granite, but also basalt, a similarly tough stone, and another which would be near impossible to have hewn with mere copper implements. Known as Giza's basalt floor, it is what many people now see as the smoking gun for evidence of advanced engineering having once been responsible for the construction of the site. Amongst the remaining fragments of the basalt floor is overwhelming evidence of ancient machinery, telltale precision signatures left on many stones, suggesting high technology was responsible for the shaping of Giza's enormous stones. Cut marks that could only have been left by high-speed disc cutting, striations, precise ridges and countless other curious features have been thankfully left upon these stones, and these surviving tool marks could one day be used to actually identify the technology once used to build the site. We now feel that the evidence to suggest that the modern attested and mass-published theories regarding the origins of the Giza Plateau, its age, and indeed its creator's past capabilities, is currently incorrect and is now overwhelming, and that it is only a matter of time before a revival of this past knowledge and indeed understandings again begins to flourish. Phoenix Hill, Xi'an China. In 1994, an extremely mysterious discovery would be made. Considered by the Chinese as the ninth ancient wonder of the world, a series of 24 ancient, artificial caves were discovered, specialists have been quietly astounded by them. And the more we learn, the more of a spectacular and mysterious achievement they are seen to be. The first thing that struck explorers were their size. Each cave has a minimum floor space of 1000 square feet, an unimaginable undertaking at the time they were thought to have been constructed. Officially dated prior to the dynasties of China, which began 3,000 years ago, meaning they are very, very old. The walls of the caves are scarred with strange uniform tool marks. The weird thing about the markings, is that they are all set on a 60 degree angle, every single chisel mark within the cave system without exception, is on an exact 60 degree cutting angle. This has led many to suspect that the caves must have somehow been dug using advanced machinery. However, because this feature is unique within our current knowledge of ancient structures, the angle of cutting could indeed have been made by hand, with the purpose of decoration, but this would have made the job of cutting them out even more laborious. 
Additionally, once the caves had been assessed and explored, a remarkable thing was realized. Although the caves were the result of excavating thousands and thousands of tons of rock, this rock seems to have vanished from existence. There is no trace of a spoil pile anywhere to be seen, it is as if the caves have always been there. No traces of their construction has ever been found anywhere, no cave writings, drawings, tools, or human remains, and nothing within historical records. The cave's construction simply doesn't make sense, and any evidence for their construction doesn't exist. Add to this the fact that the cave systems prelate Chinese civilization by some time, and show evidence of being cut out by machine and the Long Yu Caves undoubtedly become a curiosity to scientific explanation and historical understanding, to say the least. These remarkable caves are a very strong and solid piece of evidence to suggest that advanced cultures have already been and gone on this planet, or that visitors of extraterrestrial origin visited the planet prior to human development. As far as I am aware, these are the only two possible scenarios for the builders of such a construction. The cave's systems are well over 3,000 years old and still intact, whoever was capable of constructing them, was also capable of disposing of the huge mountains of rock that would have been excavated, without leaving any evidence of how they did this, or indeed built the caves anywhere. The caves are known as one of the largest underground complexes ever discovered. The fact that more is not heard about this wonderful place, is testament to their extraordinary existence, meaning no one within the scientific community, can, or want to try to explain them. Also, which I found highly interesting, when they were discovered they were completely filled with water, whether this was one sort of water, has not been disclosed, but I have personal suspicions as to how this water came to rest within these underground caverns. No fish were found within the caves, which many found odd. However, if you suspected that the waters be residual leftovers from a great flood, water from the great seas of earth, then over time, salt levels would plummet and fish accustomed to sea water would have died. Who do you think built the Long Yu Caves? The cave's existence hint towards a hidden history here on our planet, a history that we must unravel if we are ever to fully understand ourselves and our home. When one explores the most fascinating and ancient of structures resting all over our planet, you will inevitably be confronted by baffling feats on engineering and ingenuity, tasks that, to modern man, escape understanding or indeed explanation. The main consensus regarding these ancient structures has always been a tricky thing to explain. To claim that these marvelous structures were built by primitive people with only primitive tools at their disposal does not only seem absurd to most who have visited such sites, but ignorant of their true past grandeur and the specific characteristics of each of these places. Ancient sites, such as Giza, Machu Picchu, among many others, still contain very confusing artifacts, anomalous evidence, which tells a very different story to that of mainstream history. Apart from the Baghdad Battery, largely claimed to have been an ancient form of electroplating, there has been little in the way of physical evidence to suggest the use of electricity within the academically researched ancient times. Yet, there are many remnants left, which suggest such activities. Not only are there countless clear examples of past machine work stone, but most importantly, there is evidence of errors made by these same tools, misstarts and discovered fault lines, these particular stones discarded, laid bare in the quarries, revealing all the hallmarks of the machine engineering that went into building these wonderful places, these artifacts, once rubbish, now historical treasures. They can tell you the shape and movements of the tools that were being used, showing just how these machines cut into the stones, core drillings also discarded during manufacture, and cut stones discarded due to faults and cracks, revealing the complete preliminary cut marks left by the ancient stone cutters. These fragments of past activities are clearly some of the most important in unraveling these sites' ultimate secrets, yet it is rarely shared in the public arena, and even less frequently researched by official bodies. Along with this vast and perplexing array of remnants, mercilessly left where they fell, strewn amongst the debris of disruption, lay countless extremely hardy machine stone jars, vessels made from some of the hardest rocks on Earth. Some of these jars were made with a round bottom, perfectly machined, balanced on a base no bigger than the tip of a chicken's egg. 
Sir William Flinders Petrie ultimately realized that only lathe turning could have produced the symmetry and balance found on thousands of these bowls and vases. And Petrie was no fool. In 1894, he founded his own archaeological body, the Egyptian Research Account, which later became the British School of Archaeology in Egypt. He stated, for example, a bowl maker attained curves of exact circularity by rotating the bowl around a fixed blade and formed a lip by shifting the centering of the bowl. Another round bottom vase had walls of such uniform thickness that it balanced perfectly on a curved base. To have a very well-respected researcher and specialist of the ancient Egyptians to admit to a conviction of the use of power tools in these pots construction seems like quite a stunning position to take, especially when one considers that while metal chisels could have been used to shape soft limestone within ancient Egyptian times, the metals that were available to them – copper, bronze, and during the first millennium BCE, wrought iron – were far too soft to work such rock into such exquisite designs. It seems Petri would like to remain honest regarding his conclusions, yet also incomplete with his explanations, preferring to let the receiver of said information make their own realizations, preferring to avoid complication by a, by this time, rather visible enemy. One could only conclude that these relics and ancient monuments thereof were not the work of the Egyptians but further evidence to suggest that these baffling structures were built far before the ancient Egyptians, before academic understandings, by a highly technologically advanced pre-cataclysm civilization. We find it difficult to see how such work was undertaken or an explanation for our finding can be made without the use of power tools. Thankfully, the more we learn regarding these enigmatic places, the more we become aware of regarding their true history and the closer, it seems, we become to finding those who built them. A number of people who frequent our work have requested a more detailed video regarding one of the mysteries we so often focus upon here on the channel. There are many sites that we feel are deserving of in-depth focus. Our mission has always been to enlighten those who may not have been aware of the many different, compelling, and often controversial realities surrounding countless ancient ruins that throughout their lives have been explained away with a lie. Undoubtedly, the most well-known, most commonly explored, and thus the ruin most suited for our viewers' acquirement of a knowledge armory is Giza. Indeed, there are many people you will meet throughout your life that will have delved into the mysteries of Egypt. However, this experience, unbeknownst to them, may have been fraught with a limited, illogical, academic account regarding the history of Giza's plateau. This video, then, is our gift to our viewer. To prove to all those who act like they know it all how little they actually do. The characteristics of the casing stones are undoubtedly one of our own most noted achievements. We feel little, if any, notice has been given to the facts we have realized regarding these stones. Yet, the evidence we have found will remain clear for all to see. These casing stones, although of an enormous size and as such were left by a lost civilization, are far younger than the sandstone in which they encase. Most of these casing stones, unfortunately robbed out during invasions within the last few centuries, are protecting stones which are actually far more eroded and thus far older beneath. However, additionally, we began to wonder just how old could the Great Pyramids be? Could these eroding sandstones actually be concealing a far larger, far older structure beneath? Also discovered here on our channel the supporting evidence to this hypothesis, most notably along the east side of Khufu and in numerous other places where the smaller sandstones have been robbed out, is, as we suspected, a far larger exoskeleton. We strongly believe these enormous megalithic blocks that we have previously estimated to be many hundreds of tons in weight are actually the original oldest blocks of the pyramids. We also believe that the more modern, currently recognized casing stones were actually inspired by these more heavily eroded smaller sandstone blocks 
now concealing these mammoth megaliths. This makes the layers we believe that adorn the Great Pyramid numbers three, with the two more modern layers being conservation efforts, undoubtedly undertaken at vastly different times within history. Just how old is the Great Pyramid? Just how impressive was ancient Egypt? For example, the oldest surviving obelisk at Heliopolis, and therefore in Egypt, was undeniably cut, transported, and lifted into position at an unknown time in history, using now lost technology and knowledge. It is a stone 20 meters in height, weighing an astonishing 121 tons. And this enormous, unexplainable, impossible monolith is not the only one left upon the plateau. There are many more dotted all over Giza. For example, the sarcophagus of Amenemhat III, a pair of quartzite monoliths discovered in the early 20th century hang above this supposed tomb. These gigantic stones effortlessly support the weight above, each estimated to weigh 110 metric tons. The Colossi of Memnon, these two gigantic artworks were built from single pieces of stone. They are orientated toward the sunrise at winter solstice, estimated to weigh anywhere from 600 to 1,000 tons each. Modern technology allows for the movement of such weights. However, any civilization claimed by academia, actually once being responsible for the transportation of such stones, is absurd. Who could have possibly transported such enormous stones to these locations? Not only transported them, but work them into masterpieces they once were, disposing of all waste, presumably also weighing many tons. And there are many others. In the temple east of Khafre's Pyramid, for example, there lay blocks regularly, yet quietly estimated to weigh over 400 tons. How can modern academia claim such tasks were undertaken by our modern ancestors? Anyone aware of the true accomplishments involved in the construction of the Giza Plateau must now see this hypothesis as severely lacking any satisfactory explanations. Mortuary Temple of Menkaura still possesses some astonishing unexplained feats. There are some estimates of the blocks within the temple, most notably within the surviving walls of the mortuary, weighing as much as 220 tons. The heaviest granite ashlars imported from Aswan Quarry many miles away, weighing in at more than 30 tons. There are many incredible, inexplicable features upon the Giza Plateau. Many of them, unfortunately, yet predictably, little shared academically. Yet it remains a place of invaluable existent truths, many discrediting that which are passed off as current academic fact. Giza is an astonishing place and the one we feel most likely to expose academia once and for all. It is a plateau we find highly compelling. During a previous video titled Secret Missions into the Great Pyramid, in which we covered the most bizarre of artifacts once found in a seemingly inaccessible shaft, eventually discovered to be an entry shaft into the now-named Queen's Chamber. Just how this bronze ball hook and several bizarre fragments of wood found their way into the pyramids is unknown. We shared the fact that the wood had become conveniently lost, thus preventing any future dating of the artifacts or indeed this possible attempt to have once penetrated the pyramid far before the Spanish invasion of Egypt, their modern rediscovery, or indeed before the entrance to the pyramid was located. However, in a rather strange yet fortunate twist of fate, Sitting within a collection of ancient Asian relics within Scotland, an Egyptian archaeologist was shocked to rediscover these cedar fragments, once mislabeled and thus never classified, lost for almost 70 years, yet refound within an old cigar box. One has to wonder, with our prior hypothesis, and indeed the convenience of the wood somehow becoming lost, was this a deliberate act by someone? Possibly someone who realized the controversy attached to this artifact. What we find most compelling, however, and a possible motive to hide such an artifact, 
are the now-realized result of modern carbon dating, showing that the wood dates to somewhere between 3341 and 3094 BC, long before the claimed construction of the pyramid. Furthermore, although many have claimed that counterweights and timber structures were utilized in the construction of the pyramids, this wood not only predates the claimed date of their creation, but does so by some 1 to 2,000 years. So any mainstream explanation for this dating anomaly is severely lacking. However, it fits perfectly with our original hypothesis and is indicative not only of a far earlier date of construction, but could indeed have been a possible successful attempt at penetrating the pyramid's deepest inner chambers simply due to the mysterious yet impressive location in which these enigmatic artifacts were found and subsequently retrieved from. Curatorial assistant Abir Aladani found the fragments of wood as she perused the Asia section of the archives of the University of Aberdeen. Quote, Once I looked into the numbers of our Egypt records, I instantly knew what it was and that it had effectively been hidden in plain sight in the wrong collection. I'm an archaeologist and have worked on digs in Egypt, but I never imagined it would be here in northeast Scotland that I'd find something so important to the heritage of my own country." End quote. As you can imagine, we find the wooden artifacts highly compelling. There are many mysteries to be found within ancient Egypt. Unexplained, seemingly impossible mysteries, which litter the caverns, tunnels, flooded underground layers, and indeed, the once inaccessible passageways, only recently explored using advanced modern technology. However, some of the most perplexing mysteries lay in plain sight. Not only the Great Pyramids themselves, an obvious enigma for academia to explain the construction of, but many anomalous features, which can be found within objects often leaving academics baffled as to an explanation. The Cheops sarcophagus being one such anomaly. Although these pyramids are entered and explored by millions of people every year, and indeed, this mysterious sarcophagus shown to many of these inquisitive explorers, what many the funded academic tour guide often leaves absent from their explanation of this supposed tomb is how exactly it arrived at its current location. As we have explored and exposed previously, the casing stones that can be found on many of the pyramids are to us not only indicative of another phase of construction work, once having been undertaken upon these structures, but due to the erosion present and the different styles featured, are in fact indicative of more than one attempt to conserve these marvelous structures for future generations. Thus, one must conclude by more than one now extinct advanced civilization. As such, the age of the sarcophagus of Cheops could be immense. So it is not surprising that it has encountered not only grave robbers, but has been vandalized also at points within the distant past. Furthermore, and perhaps most intriguing and frustrating, is that the sarcophagus lid is missing, a lid that could have explained the past contents of this mysterious box. Or like the tomb of Pakal, exposed extremely controversial illustrations of possible past technologies. Unfortunately, however, or rather most conveniently for academics, this lid has never been discovered. Yet what is most perplexing regarding this diorite box, notably one of the hardest workable stones on Earth, is that no one seems to know how the original builders managed to transport the box to its current location deep within the bowels of Cheops. The diameter of this supposed tomb, being too large to have traveled down any of the known tunnels, which have so far been discovered within the ancient pyramid. This leaves us with two likely possibilities. One, that the diorite box was placed there and the pyramid built around it. Which is a mysterious and confusing hypothesis, mostly due to the lack of markings of significance found upon the sarcophagus, or indeed the lack of any dedicative markings found anywhere else surrounding it, 
It is as though the box was placed there without much effort to indicate any importance to his existence. Yet, to cut such a box, which has since been discovered to have been cast from one single block of diorite, would have taken tremendous effort, a feat that modern man would only accomplish with the use of diamond-edged power tools, not to mention the effort that would have been involved in moving this multi-ton stone into its found location. The second hypothesis regarding how this sarcophagus found its way into its current location is that the box itself was transported to its found location through tunnels and passageways we are yet to discover, possibly hinting at the fact that within this great pyramid, there are indeed many more hidden layers and cavities we are yet to explore or discover. Maybe the placement of this seemingly inanimate box was placed there to suggest exactly this. Furthermore, what was on the lid of this supposed sarcophagus? Why is it known as the sarcophagus of Khufu, when Khufu was not discovered within it? In fact, nothing was discovered within it. And why is the lid mysteriously absent? Where did the lid to this sarcophagus go? Why, if destroyed by grave robbers, was it not left where it lay? Did this lid contain controversial information, possibly pertaining to the original contents or indeed purpose of the Great Pyramids? We find the diorite sarcophagus of Khufu, and indeed its unexplainable journey into the center of the pyramid, highly compelling. Teotihuacan, a site we have covered many times here upon our channel. Most recently, we discussed the impressive amount of electrical material found within the numerous pyramids that dot the site, known as mica, a notorious modern-day electrical insulator that's physical origins were found to have been from a quarry over 3,200 kilometers away within Brazil. When Spanish explorers first visited the area, they asked the Aztecs who built these marvelous buildings. The Aztecs replied that it was the Quina Metzen, a quote, race of giants who came from the heavens in the time of the second sun. It is clearly a site of tremendous importance regarding lost knowledge here upon our planet, knowledge which could have been left within our very distant past. And now, an eight-year project has discovered a secret tunnel beneath the third largest pyramid within the area. A tunnel which archaeologists suspect will lead to a royal tomb. Discovered in 2003 with the use of robotic technology, similar to the technology used to discover the secret chamber within the Great Pyramid of Khufu, rumored to also be that of a royal tomb. Littered with artifacts which have remained untouched for untold millennia, now thought to be over 50,000 separate items, shedding light onto the life of those who built this amazing place, not only reveal who they actually were, but explain their religious beliefs, their technical prowess, and indeed how they built them, but most importantly, for what purpose. Upon exploring the tunnel, archaeologists have discovered an enormous pool of liquid mercury, and supposedly, it is a massive quantity filling a mysterious basin at the end of the tunnel. Could a king's tomb or ritual chamber possibly lay far below this pool of mysterious mercury? Mexican researcher Sergio Gomez has somehow been allowed to release all of these amazing discoveries, found beneath the Pyramid of the Feathered Serpent publicly, receiving little academic resistance since. Mercury is toxic and capable of devastating the human body through prolonged exposure. Academia perceived mercury as having no practical purpose within ancient Mesoamerica. But interestingly, it has been discovered at other sites. Rosemary Joyce, a professor of anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley, said that archaeologists have found mercury at three other sites around Central America, not to mention our own research into Oak Island, which has also held a legend of liquid mercury for many years. Its presence in Teotihuacan is undoubtedly perplexing and intriguing. Gomez speculated that the mercury could be a sign that his team is close to uncovering the first royal tomb ever found in Teotihuacan. The mercury may have symbolized an underworld river or lake, Gomez postulated, an idea that resonated with Annabeth Hedrick, 
a professor at the University of Denver and the author of works on Teotihuacan and Mesoamerican art. Quote, the shimmering, reflective qualities of liquid mercury may have resembled an underworld river, not that different from the river Styx. Hedrick continues, if only in the concept that it's the entrance to the supernatural world and the entrance to the underworld, end quote. Not only did the people of Mesoamerica clearly figure out how to create or derive liquid mercury from mercury ore, they also knew of deep underground water systems and lakes that could be accessed through caves. Rosemary Joyce said the ancient Mesoamericans could produce liquid mercury by heating mercury ore, known as cinnabar, which they also used for its blood-red pigment. Yet, just how these ancient people managed to figure all these amazing things out remains a mystery. We may indeed be on the precipice of one of the most important discoveries of our modern age. We will keep you posted. Teotihuacan is without doubt one of the most mysterious places within the Americas, or possibly on Earth. While the incredible complexity and architectural precision has baffled archaeologists for decades, there is a far more perplexing mystery specifically surrounding the pyramids within this ancient place. The presence of mica, a powerful radioactive insulator, is perhaps one of the biggest enigmas of these great ancient structures. Established or quite possibly re-inhabited around 100 BC until its fall between the 7th and 8th centuries, Teotihuacan was one of the largest cities in the ancient world, with over 150,000 inhabitants at its peak. According to archaeologists, the advanced design of Teotihuacan suggests that ancient builders had advanced knowledge not only of architecture, but of complex mathematical and astronomical sciences. Additionally, one of the more intriguing characteristics differentiating it from many other ancient sites is the fact that from the air, Teotihuacan strangely resembles that of a modern computer circuit board. Curiously, when Hernán Cortés and his men conquered the Aztec Empire in the 16th century, they asked the natives who had built such a colossal city. The Aztec replied, We were not the builders of Teotihuacan. This city was built by the Kina Natsin, a race of giants who came here from the heavens in the times of the second sun. The Aztecs were in fact the ancient civilization that named the place Teotihuacan, yet they did not know the original name for the city. The pyramids had remained buried, hidden under several meters of vegetation for unknown millennia, only rediscovered within the last century. Then in 1906, on the fifth deck of the Pyramid of the Sun, a thick layer of laminated mica covering an enormous area was unearthed. At that time in 1906, mica was an invaluable resource, highly priced on the world market. It is used for the construction of capacitors and is considered an incredibly efficient electrical and thermal insulator, which has a melting point of over 1,100 degrees Celsius. Most of the mica found in 1906 at Teotihuacan was unfortunately robbed out, subsequently sold at a great price to resource tycoons. Fortunately, however, not all the mica has disappeared from Teotihuacan. Today, there are still a few places where you can find the original mica, carefully laid within the pyramid's body. It seems for some mysterious reason, the unknown builders of this great ancient city managed to extract and transport this mica from far away. According to tests carried out by the Viking Foundation, discoverer of one of the rooms coated with mica, this valuable material has an unmistakable signature, allowing us to tell exactly where in the world it had originally been extracted. It was discovered that it had come from a region located more than 3,200 kilometers away within Brazil. This in of itself is an enigma. The only real purpose it would seem for the use of such an exotic material is for the management of electrical currents. A theory, thankfully, more and more talented minds are beginning to look at seriously. As a result, we may finally unravel one of the greatest mysteries still plaguing the modern man. What were the pyramids built for? Tibet, the roof of our world. Words do no justice to the untouched beauty of this far corner of Earth. A vast, mysterious and sacred place, 
embraced and protected by miles of immovable mountains. Monasteries, built many hundreds, sometimes thousands of years ago, stand in defiance of the elements, precariously placed among the clouds. Many of these very ancient structures are said to have been built on the remnants of once even grander ancient buildings, structures many religions attribute to the gods. Among the seemingly endless mountain ranges lay one mountain which is different, one which is special. It is believed by most of Tibet, and even further afield, that the god Shiva lay buried within this sacred mountain. According to ancient beliefs, this enigmatic Tibetan mountain represents the axis of the world, the stairway to heaven. In many eastern countries, Mount Kailash is considered the holiest place on earth. Some ancient sources even suggesting it is where one could find the mysterious city of the gods. It is indeed regarded within the climbing world as unascendable. A route has never been located and probably never will. Few have been brave enough to even go near this place in the past century. There may be some profound reasoning behind these ancient clusters of human beings, regarding this particular mountain over all others as sacred and as the resting place of a god. There may, however, be ulterior motives at play when it comes to the discouragement of climbers in attempting the peak. A team of Russian scientists, intrigued by the history and a possible suppression of its true nature, have suggested after covert explorations that the top of Mount Kailash is not a natural formation. It is actually the remnants of a giant man-made pyramid of great antiquity. Just how old this pyramid could be currently remains unclear. What also remains unclear is if the entire mountain is a man-made pyramid, disguised by the erosion of many millennia. The research team claimed, quote, The stratum is horizontal with the layers of stone slightly varying in color. The dividing lines show up clear and distinct, which gives the entire mountain the facade of having been built by giant hands of huge blocks of reddish stone." End quote. A mysterious claim put forward in regards to the mountain concerns rapid aging when in the area. After spending 12 hours in the region, the length of nails and hair was equal to two weeks of normal growth in some cases. Several mystics have said that the mountain has a secret entrance within it, leading to the legendary kingdom of Shambhala. Legend also states that when the ice on its peak finally melts, it will reveal the eye. Professor Ernst Muldashev, PhD, a doctor and explorer who traveled to Tibet extensively, said later in his life, quote, There are two underground countries, the Shambhala and Agartha which are each part of the gene pool of humanity and civilization. Information provided by the Thule Society shows there is a higher civilization coming from the Himalayas and divided into two branches, the Shambhala and Agartha. The former being the center of power protected by unknown forces and energy." End quote. An understanding of what sort of pyramid Kailash could be, or indeed just how special it is, may take several years to establish. I will, of course, keep you posted.
The Great Pyramids of Giza Undoubtedly some of the most incredible ancient monuments to be found anywhere on Earth. Just how old are these structures? 4,000 years? 10,000 years? 100,000 years? We recently uncovered the astonishing megalithic blocks once exposed upon the east side of Cheops. Blocks which indicate that the entire skeletal structure of the pyramid is actually made with blocks similar to those found at Baalbek. 100 plus ton blocks, revealed at some point within antiquity, most likely done by a jealous ruler in an attempt to destroy and conceal the evidence of this past, more capable civilizations were. Additionally, humans are curious creatures. Not only do we now suspect that destructive phases have befallen the great structure throughout its long life on Earth, but also, like we do today, has also before experienced being marveled at, and conservation efforts in the form of more modern casting stones have been installed, these blocks initially obstructing our view of the seemingly impossible blocks which make up its inner structure. Is there any proof to support such claims of an enormous age to be found anywhere else on Earth? Peru, a place which contains the same uncannily designed impossible pre-Incan architecture. Within the Supi Valley, some 120 miles north of Lima, is the Pyramid of Caral. Now claimed to be the oldest pyramid on Earth, and the clear erosion which it has experienced clearly makes it an obvious candidate for this title of incredible antiquity, once towering into the heavens, now virtually leveled by erosion over many, many millennia. This site has clearly received no later attention by a capable or interested civilization, left to rot with the overgrown mountains of Peru. Yet it possesses such similarities in architecture with ancient Mesopotamia, China, India, and indeed Egypt, is it now so unforgivable to suspect that all of these structures were actually built by the same civilization at the same time within history? The only difference being that the well-known and documented Egyptian civilization later moved in on the specific pyramidal structures of Giza for power purposes, while the Inca focused in on the ancient architectural land terracing. Interestingly, and yet more compelling, evidence supports previous hypotheses here on the channel. When Paul Kosak discovered Corral in 1948, it received little attention because it appeared to lack any historical artifacts, an unusual absence of any habitational evidence usually sought at archaeological sites. Could this be due to the sheer age of these monuments? that all but the remaining gigantic stones has simply eroded away? Corral is not the only pyramid to be found within Peru. There are many more which share the same evidence of great age. Near the city of Saipan is the largest pyramid concentration in Southern America, known as the Pyramids of Tucumi, or the Valley of the Pyramids. It has no less than three pyramid cities, which together have a stunning total of 250 pyramids. Tucumi lies on the southern margin of the valley and is surrounded by fertile agricultural land, thanks to the Tami Canal, which brings water northwards from the Chanque River, a perfect strategic location for a once flourishing civilization. Who were these people? When did they live? Thanks to ongoing research, not only is the officially upheld story surrounding such cities crumbling, but we are now getting closer and closer to finally answering these questions. When an ancient ruin is academically studied, it will often be attributed as the work of a far more recent, already studied, thus previously permitted group placed within known history, often a group simply incapable of such undertakings. Furthermore, not only do many sites hold evidence of a far older yet far more advanced builder having once been responsible for their construction, but such sites can often share characteristics with ancient ruins found far away, features from a said site also found on another continent on the other side of the globe. 
False doors, for example, found over countless ancient ruins spanning much of the world. This reoccurrence, along with many other similar signature features, are far from mere coincidence and can only be explained by a past, intercontinental, highly capable lost civilization, as we have postulated in the past in regards to many factors indicative of their megalithic legacy. Metal clamps, identified on differing continents, varying in style and composition relative to what was presumably readily available, so although they differ in style, the knowledge of how to create and use such ancient technology had clearly been the work of the same civilization. The pyramids of Uymir, for example, are six rectangular pyramids you would more than likely have never heard of and most certainly would not have been taught of their existence by modern mainstream academia. Built from lava stone without the use of mortar, they are uncannily reminiscent of many structures within the South Americas. They are located in the districts of Chacona, part of the town of Uymer, on the island of Tenerife in the Canary Islands, Spain. The structures have been attempted to be dismissed as nothing but 19th century buildings, argued as the byproduct of contemporary agricultural techniques. Yet their infamous shape and the signature building techniques incorporated into said structures are undeniably found elsewhere on Earth. Other pyramids employing the same methods and materials of construction can be found in various sites on Tenerife. In Uymer itself, there were nine pyramids, any yet regardless of academics attesting to them being no more than a century old, only six of the pyramids survive to this day. In 1990, adventurer and publisher Thor Heyerdahl became aware of the Canarian pyramids by reading an article written by Francisco Pedron in the Tenerife newspaper Dario de Avisos detailing the quote, real pyramids of the Canaries as Heyerdahl had hypothesized a transatlantic link between Egypt and Central America, which is a subtle way of saying a now lost yet once global superpower who once ruled the waves, he became intrigued by the Uymer pyramids and relocated to Tenerife. Heyerdahl hypothesized that the Canarian pyramids formed a temporal and geographical stopping point on voyages between ancient Egypt and the so-called Mayan civilization's ruins a claim we agree with, yet we posit that this contact was not between the Egyptians and Mayans, but was one and the same force, a far older, now lost, world-conquering civilization, an ingenious group who not only passed on their wisdom to every corner of the world, but even built in ways we are yet to understand. Unexplainable anomalies litter many ancient ruins to this day. Heyerdahl had predictably initiated a controversy with historians, esoterics, archaeologists, astronomers. Most of mainstream academia staunchly oppose such claims. By suggesting such an hypothesis, which flies in the face of already established paradigms, his research was predictably never pursued further than Heyerdahl personally took it. Yet I feel he succeeded in publishing a ruthlessly honest opinion in regards to the ruins, regardless of what was already apparently established as fact. And along with our research within Bosda Caves, and the similarities, differentiations, and other investigative strategies utilized to support such an argument of a now-lost world-going super-civilization, we feel the evidence for our case is now all but overwhelming there are far too many connecting factors to simply claim coincidence, and as the proof of this past civilization's capabilities becomes more apparent and in turn researched, the closer we become to finally finding these now lost ancestors. It is a pursuit for the truth, which we find highly compelling. Fort Ransom is a small place within the state of North Dakota, USA that may hold an enormous, yet quietly held secret. In this small slice of the rural farming lands of the United States lies a place known as Pyramid Hill, a small, modest pyramidal mound, which is very similar in shape and size to the curious pyramidal mound found in other parts of the world, such as Silbury Hill, a chalk pyramid within the UK. Long argued by a number of funded geologists 
as a mere natural formation. However, local residents, along with historical accounts within the area, have strongly disagreed with these conclusions, since their predictable acceptance by the academic community. A vast portion of the surrounding population believe, including a number of specialist historians and archaeologists, that Pyramid Hill is in fact that of a man-made pyramid. What's more, they hold to the belief that it is the oldest pyramidal structure on Earth. What makes this site the most interesting, we feel, however, and the reason for this video, is the writing stone which was found nearby some centuries ago. Clearly very ancient cup and ring marks, and constructed to form some kind of communication. They have, however, remained undeciphered. They are incredibly intriguing, and are reminiscent of a hybrid between music and Morse code. Yet all attempts to establish a translation of the pattern have been unsuccessful. Located in the Cheyenne River Valley, in southeastern North Dakota, pitted mysteriously cup and ring marked boulders appear in Saskatchewan, South Dakota, Iowa, and many other sites all over the world. Just who created them remains a mystery. Was the writing stone left by the original builders of Pyramid Hill? If so, why is it an unknown language? Who wrote it? Is Pyramid Hill really the oldest pyramid on Earth? Built by an unknown culture who clearly spoke and wrote a highly complex and as yet undecipherable language? Perhaps one day we will find out the truth. In 1917, an amazing find was made in Indonesia. Entered into the report of the Department of Antiquities, the Dutch historian N.J. Chrome also mentioned it in 1949. Employees of the National Archaeology Research Center visited the site in 1979 for a study of its archaeology, history, and geology. If the claims are proven accurate, Indonesia possesses the oldest pyramidic structure on the face of the Earth. Buried under a mound of ancient sediment. Located around 800 meters above sea level, the site covers a hill in a series of terraces bordered by retaining walls of stone, and is covered with massive rectangular stones of volcanic origin. The Sundanese people considered the site sacred, believing it was the result of the legend of King Siluwangi's attempts to build a palace in one night. Based on various dating techniques, the site has an official dating for completion by 5000 BC and quite likely much earlier. This pyramid is very old indeed. Interestingly the Lakan mountain in Borneo or rather, what the natives and tourists alike have known as a mountain for millennia, has also recently been confirmed to actually be an ancient pyramid. Drill samples from the tops of these mounds have provided carbon dates going as far back as 20,000 BC, the deeper they drilled the older the carbon dates became, peaking out at a layer of not local basalt at 90 feet. In West Java ancient knowledge had successfully been retained, indigenous communities claimed Egyptians landed, and even colonized Indonesia well before 2000 BC. The evidence for the colonization of Indonesia by the ancient Egyptians, is documented by Sir Thomas Stamford Raffles, in his volume, The History of Javam, 1830. Tomb paintings and writings show that the Egyptians were trading down the Red Sea and into the Indian Ocean. Were these structures actually created by Egyptians? Why were they placed where they lay? As I have mentioned before we know an awful lot about the Egyptian civilization, a lot of our knowledge from what they left us in written language, scrawled and hieroglyph all over these ancient monuments, we know about mummification processes in detail, we know all about their religious rituals, death practices etc, yet, alas, not one shred of writing on how they constructed such or inspiring tombs, or why make them in the shape of a pyramid, out of millions of tons of accurately placed stone. Did the Egyptians just claim these structures as their own, as an illusionary appearance of power? A drought killed the ancient Egyptians, yet their supposed sphinxes show evidence of submersion, and thousands of years of heavy rainfall, this points a logical finger at an earlier creation date. With modern technologies, testing equipment, penetrating radar, and the internet, it appears the truth of who we really are, and who our ancestors were, may be revealed to us all. We recently shared the astonishing discovery of a colossal ancient pyramid, Cholula. Not only the largest ancient pyramid, believed to have ever been found on Earth, 
but also the biggest ancient structure ever found, just like that of the Bosnian Pyramid, long assumed a mound of peculiar shape. This truly huge structure was buried under often meters of fertile earth. Some claim it was buried to conceal it from invaders, such as David Carballo, an archaeologist at Boston University, who explained to BBC Future, quote, it was abandoned sometime in the 7th or 8th century CE. The Chilateca had a newer pyramid temple located nearby, which the Spaniards destroyed." End quote. While geologists argue that over the centuries, or indeed millennia it has stood, the mud bricks its exterior was created from have fertilized and naturally grown over this huge structure, earth which still hides much of its stature from the world to this day. Yet, this makes the discovery no less of interest. If anything, it makes it all the more intriguing. Why not fully excavate the site? Are there things being hidden there? What was the purpose of such an astonishing building being made? Was it as a tribute to a deity? Or are we looking at an enormous tomb? Like the claims that circle Giza's three great structures year upon year. Are their treasures still buried beneath, just waiting to be found? Interestingly, there does indeed exist an underworld labyrinth beneath this great site. An entire town-sized maze of ancient tunnels, littered beneath the site, again a feature akin to Giza. Yet any mention of sarcophagi, treasures, tombs, or any other interesting discoveries, local archaeologists remain curiously silent, regardless of this structure's clear past importance. According to Geophys, the adobe brick pyramid stands 55 meters or 180 feet above the surrounding plain, far shorter than the 137 meters or 449 feet of the Great Pyramid Cheops in Giza but also much wider, measuring 450 by 450 meters, or 1480 by 1480 feet, versus Cheops at 230 by 230 meters, or 750 by 750 feet. Yet we must not forget to mention the astonishing precision present within Giza, seemingly absent this nonetheless gigantic structure, which we find highly compelling.